your notebook. There's more. Welcome to CN Live, Season 5, Episode 7, Depleted Ukrainium. I'm Elizabeth Voss. And I'm Joe Loria, Editor-in-Chief of Consortium News. Depleted uranium shells have been sent to Ukraine, as confirmed by UK Armed Forces Minister James Heapy last week. Britain announced last month that it would send the munitions for use with Challenger 2 tanks in Ukraine, a move that immediately escalated nuclear tensions with Russia, with Russian President Vladimir Putin threatening to place tactical nuclear weapons in Belarus just days later. The UK move comes amid indications that Kiev is increasingly desperate to the point of being willing to risk scorching the earth it is fighting for. Over the last few months, documents emerging as part of the Pentagon leak have shown Ukrainian forces are faring far worse than previously reported by corporate media. As Consortium News reported, the leaked documents show the planned Ukrainian offensive will fail miserably. Britain's decision to send depleted uranium rounds to Ukraine represents more than a dangerous escalation in the West's proxy war with a nuclear armed power. It's an example of Ukraine's willingness to target the ethnic Russian population in eastern Ukraine and poison the land that is attempting to retain, but according to the Pentagon leaks, knows it won't be able to. Depleted uranium will have effects not only on Russian fighters and possibly Ukrainian soldiers too, but also on the civilian population for years to come. Russia intervened in Ukraine after eight years of war by Kiev against the ethnic Russians in the East, who declared independence from Ukraine after the US-backed 2014 coup. The US and British corporate media appear to dismiss concerns of Russian nuclear escalation in response to the use of depleted uranium rounds. And the official line in the West is that such weapons represent a low environmental risk. However, there are compelling reasons to question the official stance. Depleted uranium rounds were used by U.S. forces in both Iraq wars, as well as the Balkans in the 1990s. Depleted uranium munitions are heavier than lead and are typically used to pierce the armor of tanks. On impact, the metal shears, burns, and vaporizes, producing radioactive dust. A 1999 report by The Guardian related the sentiments of scientists speaking in regards to Kosovo with depleted uranium, saying, quote, one single particle of depleted uranium lodged in a lymph node can devastate the entire immune system. In John Pilger's film documenting Iraq after the first war, paying the price, killing the children of Iraq, he spoke with doctors in Basra, where they reported a tenfold increase in cancer deaths. Pilger also spoke with an Iraqi pediatrician who described an influx of congenital deformities never seen before the war. In the case of the second Iraq war, the most striking reported effects of depleted uranium and other toxic substances was seen in Fallujah, where U.S. forces bombed mercilessly in 2004. The rise in birth defects in Iraq has been called catastrophic, and The Guardian went so far as to publish a piece in 2014 that accused the World Health Organization of covering up the, quote, nuclear nightmare left behind in Fallujah by the U.S., and UK. Others have compared the city's health crisis with what with that following the US nuclear attack in Hiroshima. Is this the future faced by generations of ethnic Russians in Ukraine? With Ukraine set to lose if slowly on the battlefield, what is to be gained by taking out a few more Russian tanks if it permanently renders the land a danger to its inhabitants, permeated with toxic dust, dust particles of radioactive heavy metal? How can this decision be viewed as anything but a spiteful admission that the land is being lost and that salting it is a final act of malice against ethnic Russians in Donbass? To discuss this with us tonight, we're joined by John Pilger in Australia. John is an eminent journalist and documentary filmmaker who has twice won Britain's highest award for journalism and has been International Reporter of the Year, News Reporter of the Year, and Descriptive Writer of the Year. He's made 61 documentary films and has won an Emmy, a BAFTA, and the Royal Television Society Prize. His Cambodia Year Zero is named as one of the 10 most important films of the 20th century. And we're also joined by Phil Miller in London. Phil is a declassified UK's chief reporter and the author of Keeney Meeney, the British mercenaries who got away with war crimes. He has been covering the UK decision to send depleted uranium to Ukraine and recently published an article covering court cases that linked depleted uranium exposure to service members in Europe who later developed cancer. Thank you both so much for joining us. Very welcome. Thank you. Yeah, so 
John, I I'd like to start with you. Can you just tell us uh, what you experienced in Iraq firsthand in documenting the effects of the Gulf War on civilians in Iraq? Uh, in southern Iraq, where I was at right at the end of the first Gulf War, you may remember the, the terrible road of death which the Iraqi army tried to escape the uh, the wrath of the US in Kuwait. Uh, and miles and miles of vehicles um, of fleeing Iraqi uh, military personnel were, were blown to bits. But most, most of the ammunition, most of the ordnance used was depleted uranium. And some of the, you, you could tell that from I, inspected the one end of the this convoy of death and the holes in the side of uh, armored personnel carriers were those that had been caused by the shells of depleted uranium I'd seen it elsewhere. Now right across southern Europe, Iraq, um, depleted uranium was used um, and it was used in a way that um, uh it could only be it 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 had to uh be there for years and years in the future southern iraq particularly at that time of the year is a place of the most terrible sandstorms the sand blows up it blows into your eyes your nose your throat uh it's it's everyone is is covered with it. People talk about it. It's part of it's part of life there, but it's a terrible part of life. And of course, it carries uh, all the toxics of of warfare, and particularly of depleted uranium. Um, one of the doctors referred to it as the seeds of death, uh, and you can understand you can understand why in the teaching hospital, Sartre Teaching Hospital in Basra, the scene was, um, well, it was apocalyptic. Uh, mostly children had been affected because children not only play in these toxic sandstorms, they play on the wreckage of war and they can pick, pick this up. When you consider, give you an idea, one of the doctors described it and I think accurately, as a form of nuclear warfare. Uh, an A-10 warhog fires 4,500 grams of depleted uranium in, in, in one shot. Uh, the United States used 300 tons of depleted uranium in southern Iraq. The warhog was the main instrument of delivering this uh, this this, this uh, uh, depleted uranium. Um, children all had something they had never seen before, had hardly seen before, and that is uh, neuroblastoma, uh, a particular cancer that is so rare that in most societies it's it's always a surprise, as one of the doctors said to see it, but the, uh, the pediatrician in charge of wards of children, all with uh, neuroblastoma, uh, had a book, a color album of all the children that she treated. I mean, it was quite clear. This, this of course, is, is what the researchers call anecdotal evidence. I would call it journalistic evidence, eyewitness evidence. This is, this is the kind of apocalyptic result of that war that was never really uh, reported widely and has been largely forgotten since then. And the reason it's been forgotten, if I may just add a little more to my answer, Elizabeth, the, the role of the World Health Organization, the World Health Organization, uh, in fact, um, when I was there in 1999, 2000, 
2001, the World Health Organization completed a report on depleted uranium uh, by 2001, refused to release it, censored a lot of it. I interviewed uh, Carl Sikora, who was then the British oncologist who was in charge of the WHO's cancer program. Uh, and he had printed quite a bit of the damning bits of this report in Lancet, uh, the medical magazine, and was ordered by the World Health Organization to take it out. Um, this has gone on right through to the end of the, uh, what I would call the main war, that is 2003, or the initial parts of the main war, when um, uh, um, uh, the WHO issued a preliminary report and then following Fallujah, another report, but the, all these reports had been doctored. Uh, there's so much evidence to suggest this. Uh, so depleted uranium, really the effects of it in southern Iraq, where the, the leading doctor in the Sadra hospital said, estimated it would affect 48% of the population of southern Iraq, uh, is really like a Chernobyl. Wow. Um, yeah, you've preempted a couple of my questions just about specifically, I was going to ask you about the WHO and the uh, alleged cover up there. I mean, there are Guardian articles that were, they, even the Guardian was willing to publish articles accusing the WHO of covering up this issue. Um, and, and that debate continues. I mean, to, to this day, you know, upon this news that the UK was sending depleted uranium over to Ukraine, you still have people in the West saying, no, it's basically harmless. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Mm. Well, the, then you must remember when I first saw it, uh, the so-called sanctions were in place. These were the most, as you'll remember, the most stringent, it's not sanctions, a blockade really of almost everything against Iraq that weakened Iraq and prepared it to be invaded in 2003. And Carl Sikora, the oncologist, I'd mentioned, uh, he uh, wrote in the, the British Medical Journal, uh, quote, requested radiotherapy equipment, chemotherapy drugs and analgesics are consistently blocked by United States and British advisors to the Iraq Sanctions Committee. We were specifically told by the WHO not to talk about the whole Iraq business the WHO is not an organization that likes to be involved in politics. It's a rather ironic statement at the end. But uh, those, that blockade was stopping, was really um, uh, uh, stopping, um, uh, was crippling a country. It couldn't, that's why the two UN uh, humanitarian coordinators, Dennis Halliday and Hans von Sponick, resigned. Halliday called it uh, a genocide. Uh, but the UN, in effect, the United States and Britain um, operated this medieval siege against Iraq. So by the time, time 2003 came around and the Bush and Blair um, invasion force turned up, Iraq was on its knees. Do you have any comment on the current lack of real outrage, even from independent journalism? I mean, there's not, a, I mean, we have Phil here, but there's not a lot of voices speaking out about this very, you know, stridently, like I would imagine, given the impact of this substance. Do you think that's because people are scared to talk about it in the face of, of the controversy scientifically? Huh. I don't talk about a lot of things. <laughs> And that's on the well, list. I'm talking about the independent media even. I'm not even talking that's, about that's, that's on the media. List. I mean, I sometimes think that those of us, those of us doing the work I hope we're doing um, uh, will one day give up asking why the media do certain things. They are part of the problem and they are the main instrument of propaganda. Now, I say that not rhetorically. 
having come from a lifetime in the mainstream media, they are the, the, the instrument of propaganda. All spaces of dissent, mm. uh, of sustained factual reporting on a, an issue such as this are closed. Um, and that's really the answer to your question, Elizabeth. But also it comes down to why, why are the universities so, so, uh, um, so, so quiet about this? Uh, you know, so many of the big universities, and I'm, I think I know the ones, but I won't name them because I'm not sure, uh, particularly in the United States, were involved in the... <clears throat> in refining depleted uranium. It's a very effective ordinance. It works in tank battles. It works. It, it can subdue uh, a major force very effectively. And here we have Ben Wallace, the defense minister in Britain, uh, uh, licensing depleted uranium to go to Ukraine. I think, uh, as you or Joe said at the, the beginning, that's, uh, that, that, that means that we're going to have another Iraq in Ukraine. Phil, I want to turn to you in your article that you wrote, you published recently with Declassified UK, um, where you described Italian courts finding and basically validating this link between exposure to DU um, you know, and cancer suffered by service members who were exposed in Kosovo. Can you walk us through that recent piece and what it means for this discussion? Yes, uh, thanks, Elizabeth. So I've been looking at both the um, the legal uh, reaction to to this issue and also the the kind of scientific debate, which which John touched on. And it's it's interesting that um, you know, even though among some of the scientific papers, there's this. Um, a degree of ambiguity because of the difficulties of doing long-term studies in, in war zones. In, in the legal sphere, there are hundreds of court judgments um, in Europe, um, mainly in Italy, but also um, we found one in France and one in England, where judges have awarded uh, compensation to soldiers or soldiers' uh, families after they've passed away because of these rare cancers that, that have developed after their exposure to depleted uranium ammunition. And this is um, this is soldiers who were either handling the ammunition themselves or they were being deployed to areas that had just been uh, strafed by, by NATO, um, by, by the US in, in Kosovo in particular. So I think this is, is really interesting. And also it kind of, you know, one of the reactions I've had to these stories is, well, who cares if some Russian soldiers get exposed to depleted uranium in their tanks? I mean, this shows that it's, you know, Ukrainian service personnel as well, who are, who are liable to, um, to some of the risks involved in this. Uh, there's obviously, of course, friendly fire as well, which, which has happened in, in these tank battles. Um, in other conflicts, and and then of course the civilian population living in those areas, um, either when the shells miss their targets and get buried in the ground, potentially by water sources, or just the the wrecks of tanks not being cleared away, and and um, you know children playing on them. And the UK has said that they don't feel any moral obligation to help clear up the depleted uranium shells that it sent to Ukraine after the conflict, or to even publish their firing locations. And that's different to um, with the uh, second Iraq war. The MOD did publish the firing locations and they did say they had a moral obligation to help clean up. Uh, ultimately, they didn't give much aid towards that cleanup. But, um, you know, I think that the position is, has hardened even more and um, and they, they seem to think that they can get away with it. And, uh, you know, going back to 2003, it did feel like there was a bit more pushback from the scientific community. Um, the Royal Society had done some research into the risks of depleted uranium that the MOD and the Pentagon tried to cite as, um, you know, saying it was low risk. And the, the Royal Society uh, scientist behind that research actually came out and said to the Guardian, you know, they're, they're misquoting the, the research. I, I, I've said there should be a lot of caution involved uh, and we need a long term study to find out what's going on. What's interesting is, is fast forward to this year when the UK announced it was going to send 
the depleted uranium to Ukraine, they referred to this same scientific research. They said, you know, the Royal Society said it's fine. And mm. I, I contacted the Royal Society and said, when did you last do research on this? And they said, well, we haven't updated our research since 2002 or 2003. It's, you know, our position is the same now as it was then. Mm. Um, but, you know, th the rest of the media didn't didn't pick up on that. So um, I think I think there are lots of of questions that should be being being asked about this. And and, you know, we have perhaps the scientific research, the long term studies, you know, their difficulties around doing those, particularly in places like Iraq that are still very unstable. But if you just look at the court judgments um, and I'm just talking about courts in, in NATO states, you know, in, in Italy, in France, in, in England, um, I mean, there are other there's other litigation going on, I think, in Serbia as well, um, uh, regarding the, the bombardment of, of Belgrade as well, uh, where lawyers are trying to build on the Italian cases. And I think even in Kosovo, there are some um, KLA veterans who who you know fought on the side of NATO, um, in particular towns that were heavily bombarded that have expressed concerns about this. So, you know, that's without even getting into to that side of it. You know, obviously anything um, in the Serbian courts is is liable to being dismissed as as some kind of Russian propaganda sort of thing. So I, I just looked at the, you know, Italian courts, French courts, English courts. These are all NATO member states uh, to see what what those judges were saying. Um, so that that's yeah, that, that's where we've got to with, with the research. Yeah, that's fascinating. And I, I know that you've also reported on the fact that there's no confirmation that Russia has used depleted uranium itself in the war in Ukraine, although it does possess a stockpile of those types of munition. Um, you've written that James T.P. told Parliament that the Ministry of Defense is unaware of any credible open source reports of Russia using depleted uranium in Ukraine. Can you just tell us a little bit about as well, because one of the things that I saw a lot in response to the article we published about this subject was people basically saying, well, Russia's using it, Russia's using it. And, you know, your your uh, reporting indicates that may not be the case. Yeah, so this was another thing, you know, the reaction to the first story was there was a, a, a Russian news agency article from, I think, 2018 saying that they have upgraded some of their tanks to fire depleted uranium. So lots of people were sharing this on, on social media in response to our story. So an MP asked a question in Parliament saying, you know, does the MOD have any, um, you know, has Russia used depleted uranium? Uh, and I expected them to say yes. And surprisingly, that the answer was, you know, we don't have any open source information to say they have done. And something we've seen throughout this conflict is the MOD has been very quick to declassify any intelligence it receives about Russia, um, you know, using um, white phosphorus or, or anything that's perceived as kind of, you know, something that it can call out Russia on. So the fact that they weren't able to produce any any instances of Russia actually firing the depleted uranium that it has in its arsenal, again, was 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 very significant um, and and didn't really get much reaction beyond beyond our our article, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and you bring up white phosphorus. I think that's important as well. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Is there evidence that Russia has used white phosphorus? Because I think that's controversial as well, as far as I'm aware. So, so there does seem to be, um, I mean, this recent case in, in Bakhmut of, of what looks like white phosphorus being fired. Uh, and Ben Wallace gave a statement to Parliament today where he he did say, you know, using white phosphorus in civilian areas is is illegal. But some of our other research at Declassified has been looking at how Britain fires uh, white phosphorus in Kenya, um, where it has a, a military base and it has um, access to large parts of the Kenyan countryside. And it says that's legal because it's um, it's not being fired in a, in a populated area. But I mean, I've been to those areas. I've spoken to the Samburu tribe and the, and the herders who who frequent that area. And it's um, you know it's it's a nomadic area. There's no fence around this firing range, so people are just wandering through. And there are real concerns there about you know the health consequences of that. Um, they, they've also fired um, faulty ammunition that hasn't exploded, and then herders have subsequently picked it up or stepped on it and, and there have been huge numbers of, of um, uh, limbs being lost and people even being killed from that um, going up as recently as I think 2015. So um, again I mean there, there are so many double standards here um, but um, I mean yeah the UK doesn't really seem to be interested in the real risk of, of using these these munitions. Did you want to ask a couple of questions? Or John, did you want to jump in? I'm sorry, I missed that. 
I just, it looked like you wanted to say something a moment ago. I didn't know if you had a comment. Well, uh, I mean, that's the research and the work that Phil has done on this is very important. I mean, it, it's typical of the utter disregard for people's lives, their reaction to uh, the MOD's reaction to uh, uh, whether uh, depleted uranium affects people that uh, Kenya isn't a populated area or whatever the term is used. Like Phil, I know that area. And uh, it, I was just thinking as he was as he was describing the nomadic area where people come and go, uh, I was thinking of Maralinga here in Australia, where in the 1950s, Sir William Penny and his uh, uh, UK atomic energy people exploded um, <clears throat> 30 uh, nuclear bombs in the desert at Maralinga. And uh, that was the same, almost word for word the same excuse that there weren't people there that they came and went and of course that's the nature of the people they do came uh, do uh, uh, wander throughout the country uh, in that particular area and many of them were very seriously affected um, but the um, it is it is a truly shocking business that the last research, um, much of which was blocked, as I say, was done uh, around uh, uh, 2003, 2004, unless there's research we don't know anything about. Um, it's interesting that I think, I don't know whether this <laughs> um, relates to what Phil is describing, uh, but the only time I think the US and therefore the UK has said that they have actually used um, depleted uranium was when the Dutch government uh, extraordinarily uh, got from the United States, the Defense Department, the coordinates of the, uh, uh, of the use of depleted uranium in in Iraq, and it did so under pressure from the uh, Dutch uh, anti-war group, PAX, which had brought in a, um, a freedom of information thing. And the British, I understood, went along with that. I'm not absolutely sure about that. But what that showed, uh, what those coordinates showed, was that the certainly the US had used it uh, widely all over uh, southern and central um, Iraq. Phil, are you muted? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't know the exact kind of sequence of events as to how, how the firing locations came to be published. Um, I think the US were much more reluctant than the UK to release where they had fired those their munitions and and of course the US had fired far far more so um I, I think yeah we do we do have a data set of where the UK fired them in Basra in 2003 but I, I don't think we have the whole picture and certainly not the US side of it um I mean with with Ukraine it's these these 14 tanks Challenger 2 tanks that Britain's sending that will be able to fire depleted uranium rounds and we don't know exactly how many of the rounds they've they've given with the tanks um the minister has said they've sent several thousand tank rounds some of which are the depleted uranium um variant and um you know germany is sending tanks which fire tungsten rounds instead of depleted uranium um you know the uk is is really kind of a, an outlier here in its in its use of the weapon i mean together with, with the us um, and actually, I think the UK has found it hard to export its Challenger 2 tanks because it's it's not a standard NATO type of ammunition. Um, and they're upgrading the Challenger 2 tank to Challenger 3, which will have a different tank turret that won't fire depleted uranium. So I think even in the MOD, there is a realisation, although they don't like to admit it in public, that this ammunition is you know, very outdated. Um, I don't think it's been produced for many, many years now. 
Um, so this stockpile that, that that's being fired is is probably 20 years old or so. Um, so it does look like they're just sort of, you know, giving it to Ukraine to, to try and use it up in a way. Um, and there, there are also, you know, conflicting statements because um, Ben Wallace likes to kind of ridicule Russia's uh, tank capabilities and point out that they're using um you know oh. tanks from the from the 1950s and the 1960s oh. because they're they're getting so desperate so you know that obviously you know if, if they're using such old tanks then why do we need such a why does ukraine need such um uh effective rounds to punch through the armor if if they're you know getting out museum pieces so that you know there are lots of inconsistencies in in the mod's line it doesn't it doesn't add up um but yeah there hasn't been i mean that i think on this issue it's probably in the uk it's had the most kind of backlash um there's been almost uniform support towards the uk government's policy on ukraine and this is probably one of the first issues that's made people start to think you know mm. whose interests will be really serving here and if this is going to you know spread toxic metals across across ukraine uh you know are we really do we really have ukraine's best interests at heart here so i think it started to get people to think a little bit uh, and then we've had the pentagon papers as well which which highlighted more about British troops being on the ground and you know the near miss the spy planes over the Black Sea and how how close some of those near misses have been um so maybe you know and the war's been going on for over a year now people might be willing to start thinking a bit more about uh you know whether whether really they're being given the full picture um and and whether this really has to can only end in one way or whether a peaceful solution is is possible it's so typical, Phil, isn't it, for this double story that Russia is this massive threat that has to be opposed to save the free world. And on the other hand, they have this outmoded equipment that they're they're a joke. They, they have one aircraft carrier, but they're this big threat. And uh, you also quoted Ben Walls before saying that white phosphorus was illegal. So why is the use of depleted uranium not illegal? The way landmines or chemical or biological weapons have been banned in UN treaties. Why is there no UN treaty or why is this weapon not included in some of the previous treaties let's say maybe the chemical weapons uh treaty does anybody either john or phil have any ideas about why this is not outlawed and has there ever been any effort to come up with such a treaty well i know they've yeah, tried inside true. of the united nations joe um uh to get through uh resolutions that call for updated research I imagine the kind of research that is needed before a treaty of that kind uh, can be agreed. And it's been blocked over and over again. It had 155, every two years, the General Assembly votes on, on depleted, on, on uh, more depleted uranium research. And every, every couple of years, the same suspects um, mount a campaign against it that's mainly france israel the us and the and the uk um i don't quite understand as i understand that quite recently 155 countries voted yes then why that isn't a majority and the research doesn't go ahead i don't know but clearly that research uh is needed everything as as phil has said is 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 out of date. The last, the last papers that we know of, the last WHO papers, uh, are, are twenty years ago. Bill, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I, th I think. I mean, J John knows more about the backstory to this than I do, but that, that's my reading of it as well as it. When it's come up at the UN, the UK and, and countries that use depleted uranium have blocked efforts to to ban it or even do research into it. Uh, and I mean, we see that in lots of these international treaties that um, I know from my research into UK archives that they will uh, lobby and try and manipulate different UN committees to ensure, um, you know, a, a ban on mercenaries is something that I looked at. The UN was trying to pass a ban on mercenaries in the 1980s. The UK was was lobbying against that and tried to water it down and kill it and ultimately didn't didn't vote for it. Um, you know, fast forward now to where we've got all this concern about the Wagner Group. Well, what's interesting is actually, you know, historically the UK has opposed international efforts to outlaw mercenaries. Um, and obviously Liz Truss has, has been um, she supported Brits going out to fight for for Ukraine. 
um, last February, which <clears throat> you know could fall under some definitions of, of mercenaryism. So um, yeah, I think we you know these international laws are obviously shaped by the powerful states at the UN to try and uh, protect their interests as, as much as they can get away with. You, you managed to make a few damaging statements in the few days she was prime minister. Um, there's no doubt, I think, at least amongst us, that this is a very dangerous substance and it causes these illnesses. And I'm going to read in a, a little bit later from the Department of Veteran Affairs of the United States, where they're basically saying, talking out of both sides of their mouths, and they are saying it doesn't have this effect. But if you feel like you've been poisoned, come and be treated by us. So I want to know whether Russia is, despite that, that it's certainly a very toxic substance and causes the deformities and the cancers that John was describing. Is Russia going a little too far in describing it as a, like a dirty bomb? And did it warrant them uh, deploying these nuclear missiles that they will control on the territory of Belarus? Hmm. That's up for either of you. Mm -hmm. Look, Phil, do you want to... Well, I mean, I mean, I've not I've not been to southern Iraq and, and spoken to, to victims firsthand. Um, I mean, I, I guess it's not the same as a, you know, a, a nuclear reaction, uh -huh. um, a nuclear explosion. Um, it's more of a, um, a, a chemical toxicity issue. But I mean, we we know that Russia has been um, looking for any justification to move these weapons into Belarus. I think they even said in in around January this year, that if if depleted uranium was sent with the tanks to Ukraine, they would see that as a red line and they would retaliate. Um, and then lo and behold, when it came to light, I think in March that Britain was sending these weapons, the Kremlin very quickly reacted in this way. You could say it's an overreaction, but they had said they would react like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, why, why didn't the UK... Uh, more on the side of caution, particularly when you know it's only fourteen tanks out of several hundred. You, you, you wonder what real advantage on the battlefield this is going to give Ukraine. Um, you could just say it's a bit of a PR own goal by the MOD. Is is one way of looking at it? But um, I, th yeah. I think it's. A, I'm sorry, Phil. Yeah, that's all. That's all. The, the what you were saying that it, there isn't a, whether it's a whether it's a a dirty bomb or not well it's dirty in its its after effects uh, and when you consider this that that it uses in fact solid uranium um, when a warhog fires its 4500 grams uh, it's solid uranium uh, now um, <clears throat> yes it's a depleted form, but that's very close to a, a form of nuclear warfare. It has to be. Uh, and all, of, all the effects, why the uh, uh, revelations of the effects of this on the population are so, um, are so damning is that they're very similar. And the word was used over and over again in Iraq, in fact, as I understand it, it appears in the, the WHO report that was not published, and that's Hiroshima. We have our own Hiroshima. Uh, it's certainly a form of that. Uh, it's a, a refined form of uh, nuclear warfare. Um, that's, again, that's why <laughs> it's so effective. I mean, if Britain really is serious about sending and sending depleted uranium to ukraine it shows first of all how desperate they are rather than this as phil has mentioned this nonsense about broken down russian tanks in fact the tanks being ranged against uh, ukraine or anything but and they're worried uh, because the use of depleted uranium sounds certainly sounds to me like uh, uh, a pretty desperate a desperate measure but its effect on the population uh no it wouldn't be instant but it would soon be evident the devastation that it would cause in uh, uh, populated areas 
you know, from the Veteran Affairs Department website, it says the uranium remaining is depleted of about 40% of its radioactivity, but retains the same chemical toxicity as natural uranium. In other words, 60%. This is the U.S. government. Yeah. Admitting that, you say, Phil, when they ignored this uh, red line again that Russia put down, it's very similar yeah. to how this war, this this phase of the war and the Russian intervention began when they put forward those treaties in December 2021, Russia, to NATO and the United States to try to create a new security architecture in Europe. Russia said that if this was ignored, they would take technical military uh, re- response. What did that mean? And they ignored that, uh, did not negotiate the treaties. And wanted, in my view, wanted this invasion so they could launch their information and economic and proxy war to try to bleed Russia. Uh, before I hand it back to Elizabeth, uh, John, you bring up the point of desperation. And I think this is the key part that this uh, article that Elizabeth wrote for us, which is what this show is uh, discussing, is that they they know from these Pentagon leaks that they're not going to win this offensive. And there's a lot of trepidation amongst Ukrainian officials to do it, but they seem to be being pushed by the West to do it anyway, to try to get a better negotiating position or or for whatever crazy reason. So knowing that they are not going to succeed with this offensive, why would they use these weapons other than, as Elizabeth has suggested, to try to just take some kind of revenge or punishment against the people? Do you either of you agree with that? Perhaps it's to draw the Russians into doing the same thing, and then they can go, I mean, I'm guessing here, uh, but uh, then then to condemn them publicly, uh, to, to draw the Russians into making their own uh, radical moves in, uh, I don't know. I mean, the whole, the whole terrible business in, in Ukraine has been about provocation. Uh, and uh, the propaganda is all about provocation. Almost everything that comes out of Ben Wallace's mouth is provocation. Uh, and it, it, it's so perhaps this is part of the the very very uh, dangerous game they're playing. I don't know. Don't know. Do you feel that this is t- the ethnic Russians specifically as well, the civilians in that area, in Donbass? I'm sorry, I missed the beginning. Well, given. Given the fact that this, you know, as we were discussing, may not make that much of a military difference in Ukraine's favor, yeah. despite their desperation, does this look like a targeted attack on the ethnic Russian civilians in Ukraine? Well, yeah, I mean, what are they going to fire them at? They haven't actually been, from what I understand, and I may be wrong here, that there hasn't actually been big set piece armor battles. There have been a few, but there hasn't been that that's when depleted uranium comes into its own. Otherwise, yes, you fire them into people live in these huge tenements. uh, And uh, uh, the human effect will be devastating. So oh, I had another question kind of aimed at you, and that is, do, do you know if there are any other types of uranium Um, you, you've frozen there. Um, not you. It has indeed. Yeah. Um, let's see if she comes back to us. Um, I'm going to gonna ask. An, I'll ask a question. Um, uh, all right. I think I think I can. I can. Uh, yes, sir. I, yes, sir. Question. All right. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think I can see where Elizabeth was going with this. So she might have been trying to ask about other countries uh, supplying depleted uranium uh, to Ukraine, because it's interesting that the the US, the the White House, have denied that they're sending any of their depleted uranium ammunition to to Ukraine. And whether that's true or not, I don't know. But I thought it was interesting that publicly they have contradicted the UK's position. Um, mm-hmm. And so the kind of you know the warthog ammunition that John was talking about that that hasn't hasn't been sent um supposedly so you know if if it is so safe to be fired then why aren't both the us and the uk sending sending these weapons um so again that just seems to be another kind of contradiction in in the official narrative um there's also been research that shows there are amounts of plutonium um in in the uk's depleted uranium 
um, stockpile uh, because of impurities in how the um, I think it, it was it came from reactors in the US and there were some some amounts of plutonium in there as well. So again, you know, it's not just uranium um, in there, but there, there are small amounts of plutonium as well. So uh, it's a pretty messy cocktail. Yeah, yeah. So much of a, so much of Ukraine is propaganda. It's very, very difficult to find out. I think, from certainly from our distance, of 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 what is happening. It's uh, uh, it's been a propaganda war like none other, in my opinion. Um, Joe, I may have to uh, take off now. I'm afraid I've got. Okay, that's. Thank well, you very much for right. being with us. Yeah. Uh, Appreciate it. Yeah. And Elizabeth back with us. So. Really. Yes. Thank you, John. Really Thank you for your insight. Thank you, John. And unless uh, Phil, unless you or Joe have any other comment, I guess I'll close it down. It's been a great discussion. I really appreciate all of your time tonight. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for having me on. All right. Okay. With John Pilger, with uh, Phil Miller, with Joe Lauria, uh, I'm Elizabeth Boss. This has been CN Live.